Welcome to Wisdom For You, hosted by the Rev. Dr. Johnson A. Adasiman, Apostle, Chairman, and Trustee of One God Ministry, a global church. Wisdom For You is a Bible-based show that focuses on providing wisdom and ideas to assist individuals in addressing real-life challenges. This show encourages viewers to anchor their faith in God by standing firm and believing in His promises to give everyone a blessed life with an expected end. Remember the following from the book of Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not onto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Reverend Adesman, you've talked about the definition of repentance as a feeling of regret, changing of the mind, being sorrowful for sins. Elaborate a little bit on, on what is repentance. It is uh, the focus from the inner heart of a human being that recognizes that they've done something wrong. Whether or not they have done something wrong against another human being or against the society or they've done something wrong based on their own moral standard and they feel very sorry for what they've done. And if you don't feel very sorry for what you've done, you sometimes you live with guilt you live with pain, with sorrow, and then also you live in sin. So is repentance a feeling or is it an action? It is an action that needs to be taken by every individual that have, you know, a clear conscience. Because some people don't have conscience. They do certain things and they keep doing it. But if you have a conscience and you have a very strong moral value, you need to feel sorry when you have done something that is not right, and you want to repent so that God can forgive you, society can forgive you, individuals can forgive you, and this can happen at every level of the society. It could be a father and a daughter, a mother and a, and a son, or, you know, an office supervisor and an employee. But when you do know that you've done something wrong, and you need to repent. Why is it important to repent? I mean, I understand if you do something wrong against somebody else, you should say sorry, you should feel bad, or you do something against, but what about against God? I mean, isn't he just a forgiving God? Why do we need to do anything? Because Jesus uh, laid down the foundations, you know, for us on this. It was the example that says that we need to repent uh, of our sins. In the book of Romans 3.23, uh, it was made very clear that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that scripture is very powerful, which means that we all need to be mindful that we can't keep going every day thinking that we're perfect. So, you know, and the scripture made it very clear that we need to repent of our sin. And then when we do that, God loves us. And then Jesus himself at the cross in the book of Luke, and, uh, you, you know, for those that want to read, uh, even when he was being crucified, uh, he was able to forgive all the people there. But then, even though the people didn't even repent, he saw the pain he went through. So in teaching us as a follower of Christ, he wanted to make sure that we repent of our sin when we deal with the community and the world at large. So let's say somebody wants to repent. What's the first step that they have to take? First of all, they have to come to the process of self-realization. And nobody can really do that for you. You have to go to your inner heart, inner conscience, to realize that what you've done is wrong. Some people try to justify 
their action. You don't justify your action. You try to come to the process of self-realization. You went to a store and stole a candy. And if you don't realize that what you've done is stealing, that is against the Ten Commandments. And it's going to be very difficult for somebody else to let you know what you've done is wrong. The only thing that will bring it to your attention will be you being arrested by the police officer for stealing. Or the second thing that will bring it to your attention is God will punish you for you know, stealing because he said thou shalt not steal. But you have to self-realize that you've done something wrong. So once you've realized it, then what do you do? When, once you've realized it, then now you need to you know, take ownership. See, realization is the first step. You have to take ownership and say, I need to make whole or make amends. For example, you know that you were very rude and destructive to your supervisor at work. And you know that you know, the language that you used was not comfortable. So it makes sense to say, I need to own this. What I did was wrong. I shouldn't have said this or that. So I take responsibility for it. Then that is the second step. The third step now is to have the courage to act, which means now I want to approach the individual that I have offended to say, I take ownership for my action. I'm responsible for what I've done. I am, you know, apologizing for my behavior. And I want to make sure you know I'm deeply sorry. But we not only have to do that with individuals, we do the same thing with God. God wants us to come, you know, with the understanding that we have sinned and that we are truly sorry and that we are truly repenting of the sin. Well, we, as you said, we sin all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, is this something that we're, we have to keep doing, like every day? Are we in a process of repentance? Uh, yes. Uh, someone asked Jesus, he said, how many times do you have to forgive your brothers and sisters? He says, 70 times 7. If you multiply that, if you're a mathematician, you will know that that is, I mean, an awesome number. So you're talking, you know, 400 and some, you know, number of times. So that's a long time. Yes, every day we always have to come to God with a number of different steps. One is to thank Him that we have life. Secondly, to ask Him for forgiveness of the sins of the previous day or the previous moment. So it's an ongoing process. As long as we are pursuing the journey of salvation, we have to continuously repent. So do you recommend like every night before you go to bed maybe to do a, a review of the day and and think about what you've done that day and, and repent and ask for forgiveness? Uh, not in that context. What I do recommend is that, you know, for those that are really want to be on top of things, pray every three hours, you know, and ask God for the forgiveness of your sin. And then during that process, the Holy Spirit has the power of letting you know what you've done wrong. And if you, the Holy Spirit touch your heart and says that you've done something wrong, you need to, you know, take the initiative, you know, and now go and repent. So what happens if you don't repent? I mean, there's people that are sitting and they seem perfectly happy, not repenting. Well, but there are consequences for every action. Number one, God does not like a proud person that does not repent. If you don't repent, then you are not actually on the good side of God because God wants us to repent because it has been laid to us in the scripture that we must confess all our sin so that we must, you know, reach out to the other people we may have hurt. So secondly, if you don't, you're going to live with the guilt. So let's talk about the benefits. You, you touched on it briefly. What's, yeah. What are some of the benefits of repentance? One of it is that you can approach God without fear. When you truly repent, you can approach God without fear. When also you repent to man or woman, you can also approach them without fear. They will know that you have a clean heart. Secondly, you are able to engage yourself in the higher spiritual level, which means then when you're praying, you are connecting with God with a heart that is sincere, pure, and articulate. But when you don't repent, you are carrying some baggage with you, you know, that does not allow you to connect with God at your higher spiritual level. What about, you know, a sin that maybe somebody is just too attached to, mm -hmm. to repent, and, and they're being very honest with themselves and saying, you know, I like this sin too much and I don't want to stop doing it. If you turn that to God with the following three steps, one, to admit that you have a problem, secondly, surrendering to Jesus because through him you get to the Heavenly Father, and then asking for God to take that away from you, then you will find out that 
all will be well with your soul. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll continue our discussion about repentance. Wisdom for You is brought to you by One God Ministry, a global church. You can visit us on the web at www.onegodministry.org, and you can reach us on Facebook and Twitter. We invite you to become a part of our dynamic, spirit-led, Bible-based, multiracial, and non-denominational church dedicated to the salvation of souls. We are one people, worshiping one God for one purpose. We're back now with Wisdom for You with the Reverend Dr. Johnson A. Adasman, and we're talking about repentance. So Reverend Adasman, before the break we were talking about the benefits of, of uh, repentance. Mm -hmm. um, you say that there are four clear benefits, mm -hmm. one being restoration. Yes. Explain that. When you repent, there's restoration for all the parties involved. Let's start with the person that created the problem to start with. You are restored to your highest spiritual being because you know you've done the things that have commanded by Jesus Christ. That is, if you offend anyone, go out there and make a mess with them. So you are totally restored to your highest being. Then the person that you have offended, you know, or you stole candy or whatever you did to them, they are also restored to their highest, you know, level because their anger, their animosity, you know, is gone. But there are still some people that don't know how to forgive. But once you've done the repenting and you've actually approached the people, you're released and God now looks favorably on you. If the person you repented to don't want to forgive you, it's no longer your issue because it's now between them and God. But if they accept, you know, your own apology and amends that you make and so forth, they will be restored and the person that created the problem will be restored and then there will be peace for everybody. The next is restitution. Yes. Restitution means is that, you know, when you steal from 7-Eleven a piece of candy, and you know that candy costs a dollar, what Jesus says is, you go back to 7-Eleven, not only pay for a dollar, and I ask them whether they want to charge you interest on the dollar. So it's not just sufficient for you to tell the 7-Eleven clerk and say, I stole a chewing gum, yesterday it was $1. You paid that $1, ask them whether or not there's a penalty for it. So you have to make amends and restitute for what you've done. And that's why sometimes with husband and wife, you know, when they have, you know, dispute, and then one of them has to make dinner, or the other one has to take the other one to a movie, you know, to, you know and whatever it is, someone has got to arrange a date to make sure that they know that they are truly sorry. Somehow, it is always good to do something that makes the other party know that you are truly sorry. Your words sometimes are not enough to let other people know you must pay. And that's why, you know, in the justice system, and, you know, we tell people to go do community service, and they do some crazy stuff, running in a traffic light, you know, 10,000 times, rather than throwing them into jail. We tell them to go ahead and clean the gutter in only highway for maybe six months you know so that they can pick back to the society on what they've done but you know there's some problems that we do or sins mm -hmm. or mistakes mm -hmm. that don't have any restitution uh, you yeah. can't uh, uh, the, I, I would disagree with that and some of the uh, sins that people commit or whatever they do that does not have restitution uh, could be done privately but it's still restitution. For example, uh, if you do have, you know, a child that is cheating, you know, in the house, stealing, you know, whatever that is, and their parents don't even know that this is going on. And they are the only one that knew about it. But this person really stopped doing what they're doing and prayed to God, you know, for forgiveness. And because, you know, the child was so afraid, I didn't want to bring it, you know, to the parents. But there's some restitution that going on there. One is that the whole, you know, action of going to steal has stopped. And, and then also the child does some things in terms of changing the behavior 
that makes the parents, wait a minute, his behavior is kind of funny. Something is not, you know, we, are, we can't put our finger into it. Start cleaning the room, start doing things that they don't do before without not actually verbalizing what they've done. So even though sometimes people don't speak out the process of restitution, inwardly, we can also restitute for what we've done. And outwardly, you need it, you know, as well as inwardly. The next one, uh, as far as benefits of repentance, is positive relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah, this is a very important one. Let's start with the relationship with God. When we do repent, God is so proud of us. And he, he looked at us as a shiny example. It is very clear in the scripture, both, you know, all the uh, gospels that says, you are the light of the world. You know, this shiny light that is out there to bring, you know, salvation to many. So Jesus love when we take the example to go out there and tell people, say, we are sorry. And, you know, and then he loved to see us, you know, behave that way. And he also said that it's very difficult for proud people to be able to get grace and mercy. So when you repent, you become a shining light. And then you get a lot of inner peace and you are a shining example to the rest of the world. One of the examples from the Bible is the parable of the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. A very clear example mm -hmm. of um, sinning, mm -hmm. repentance, and returning to the Father. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, let me, let me touch on about that. This was a situation where this rascal kid, and I call him a rascal kid, because we have a whole bunch of people that are in that you know, arena, you know, in society today, where they came from a very affluent family. And by the way, you need to know I came from the school of hard nuts. So the fact that I'm on One God TV doesn't mean I've always been on One God TV. You know, I, when I grew up, I, you know, there was no shoes on my foot. I have to, you know, go to, you know, the supermarket to get expired bread that I will eat for the rest of the week. Anyway, let's leave that alone. Let's get back to the prodigal son. What happened was that this child took a lot of the asset of the father and went ahead and squatted all of them, went to a different land, didn't care about, you know, being accountable for them. He had a brother, by the way, who didn't, you know, do the same thing. And then after he squandered all the wealth that he, you know, he got from the parents and everything else and so forth, he actually now started eating from the pigs, from swine. And now was almost like a slave to all of the people that were farming, you know, pigs. And then he realized that life could be better. Something touched him. I believe it was the power of the Holy Spirit that touched him. And that's the self-realization that you talked yeah, about. That was the self-realization. He said, how can I find myself in this particular situation? I knew where I came from. God gave me a better life. I would rather go back to my father and be a slave there than to stay here in my pride. So again, he owned. See, that was the second step that I talked about earlier on, ownership. He owned his problem. He took ownership and said, I made a mistake. I don't care, even if my father killed me, I would rather go there and die than to stay here and be eating, you know, the waste from swines and pigs. So he summoned up the courage to go back. Here was the deal. And when he went back, the father did not even ask a single question. He prepared a grand old party and celebration to receive the child on. That's what Jesus would want us to do. He didn't say, you know, you did all this crazy thing wrong, and then you did all this quantum and so forth. He received that, you know, and the child said, I was sorry, and I was glad home. The brother was so upset. He said, how come are you taking, you know, my brother now to be, and you are having this wonderful party, you know? He said, he was once lost, but he was found. But you have been with me, but he was lost. Jesus wants us to reach out to the lost. He wants us to bring those, you know, that have strained apart, not to be judgmental of those that have committed, you know, sins or crime. Again, let's go back to Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We need to repent, we need to be humble, and we need to take ownership and accountability for our action and make amends, restitute, be restored for ourselves and restore others. We're going to take a quick break and we'll come back and continue our discussion about repentance. Thank you. Wisdom for You is brought to you by One God Ministry, a global church. 
You can visit us on the web at www.onegodministry.org and you can reach us on Facebook and Twitter. We invite you to become a part of our dynamic, spirit-led, Bible-based, multiracial, and non-denominational church dedicated to the salvation of souls. We are one people worshiping one God for one purpose. Welcome back to Wisdom For You, hosted by the Reverend Dr. Johnson A. Adasiman. We're talking about repentance, and uh, Dr. Adasiman, before our break, we were talking about the prodigal son, yeah. and um, how he realized he had done something wrong. Mm. He repented in his heart, and then repented to his father. Mm. Uh, one interesting thing is that the father, who represents God the Father, mm -hmm. was looking for him. Mm -hmm. He didn't, he wasn't sitting at home. Mm -hmm. He was out looking and waiting for his son to come back to him. Mm -hmm. Well, that's also what Jesus is doing. Jesus is always looking out for us, and he wants us to come closer to him. And he, I think, said that one soul was worth looking for. So sometimes we forget all about that. And that, you know, uh, even in the church, uh, if you have one of your members that you haven't seen for a while, have done something crazy, and, you know, it is worth going, you know, to the ends of the earth to try to reach out to them to make sure you know, that, you know, they know that you care about them. And, you know, sometimes some of them are homeless. They have difficult situations that they can't control, that only God himself can save. So the story of the prodigal son, you know, let us know that all of us are valuable in the sight of the Lord. And many need to be united with the unity of the Spirit to care for all and love all and hate none. You mentioned the church. What's the role of the church in helping people to repent? Uh, one is having a loving arm. One of the things that really we're trying to do with the One God ministry, we have created, for example, the membership care team, where we want to demonstrate the love of Christ to people, regardless of what situation they find themselves. Because out there in the world and in the society, people have the pressure of the job, lack of unemployment, bills to pay, people get rejected, and they have medical issues. We want the church to be a spiritual hospital where when people walk into it, they can see, they feel love, they can see it, then they can you know, breathe it, and then they can feel that support structure. It's very, very important. Secondly, when people come to the church and reveal their inner being on some of the things they've done wrong within the society, it's not for us to judge them or to condemn them. It's for us to be there, to be looking for God, to give them the support that will re restitute, restore, and then reconcile them back to the ministry of God. We are a church of re restoration and reconciliation. And every church should be that way, to restore people back and to reconcile them back to Jesus Christ. I wonder if you have an example that you can share of maybe one of your parishioners that had a positive impact from repentance. Yeah, but I can share, but uh, you know, we maintained a lot of confidentiality. Uh, being at my level, you will know that I've done a lot of counseling. Um, I've had a lot of people with all kinds of problems. People that were doing drugs, people that stole money, people you know, you know, that you know, molested other people and all that. Uh, one instant, uh, let me take a very simple one. I had, um, you know, a gentleman, as a matter of fact, this is public. If you look at our miracles list, uh, it became public. Um, this almost cost him his marriage. Uh, he was a very heavy smoker. He went from smoking, you know, cigarette to now smoking all kinds of other things. And then this went into the marriage and everything and so forth. But when he comes home, he would now abuse the wife, you know, because his state of mind was different. Uh, but he would deny that he always, you know, would take all these other drugs and everything else and so forth. But the Holy Spirit led him to come talk to me. And we listened to it. And this is nothing but a miracle. 
And uh, I happened to, this was in my office, in my own conference, not even at the church. And I said, we need to give this problem to Jesus Christ. And, um, and we're going to pray right now. So I turned up my phone. We prayed. He was in tears and he was, had the move of the Holy Spirit. And then he was shaking. And then he said, I saw a sign and a light that came to my life that I've never seen before. And that light sh shined so heavily on my forehead that I was almost blind. But when the light was gone, the light says, all have been taken away from you, go in peace. I said, well, that's the power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. From that day on, it's written in our miracle book, if you want to look at them. He did not smoke marijuana anymore. He did not smoke cigarette anymore. Every time he, he would hold cigarette, his hand would be shaking. And he could not. And it would be like a bitter, you know, leaf on his mouth. And God totally took it away from him. And he went back and apologized to the wife for all the abuse and all the pain. They went through about three months of counseling. You know, had a beautiful child. And then he was almost going to lose his job because he was always calling it sick, especially after the weekend. And they put him on probation. And then he became one of the best employees, promoted to become a manager and even get security clearance in one of the jobs that he had. So, again, we are a ministry of restoration, reconciliation. And Jesus wants every one of us to be made whole. But we have to take ownership for our sin. We have to, you know, be accountable. We have to have the courage to address them and humble enough to be able to take the actions that will make other people whole. You know, we talked about the benefits of repentance, mm. but how about, how do we know that repentance, that our repentance has been accepted? How do we know that it's worked, aside from, you know, the miraculous uh, results? Mm. Well, number one is you have inner peace. Those people that have not truly repented, they don't sleep well if they want to be honest with you. They don't sleep well. And those people that have stolen, you know, from other people, they are always on the guard. And those that are drug dealers, they are always watching to see whether the cops are watching. They never have inner peace. When you truly repented and then let go all of the bad habits and behavior, you have inner peace. Secondly, your spiritual connection with God it is at the optimal level where you can approach God without fear and you can approach any man or woman without fear and then your outlook in life, you are very healthy. People wonder why you're always smiling, why you have the energy that you have, why you are always able to do what you do just because you have this freedom that has been given to you by living a life with not, you know, without bitterness, a life you know, with freedom, you know, being relieved from all of the grudge and guilt of life. And it seems like there's almost like an end point of you reach this inner peace. Mm -hmm. But what about the people that are still struggling? They repent and then they fall again, and then they repent and they fall again in the same sin. And, you know, they'll, they'll just give up? There are three categories of those people. The first category of those people that have the most problem are those that have not accepted Jesus as their personal savior. Because once you accept Jesus as your personal savior, number one, now you can surrender your problem to Jesus. Secondly, we are also commanded that we need to be baptized for the remission of our sin so we shall receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And thirdly, we are asked to fellowship with other believers and other people that have been gifted with the same power that other Christians have so that you don't find yourself always being in a circle of the wrong people. Because when you go to church, you are taught the right word to listen to. So you are not in a circle of people that are always smoking, drinking. I don't have anything against people that smoke and drink. But I'm saying that you are not perpetuating the things that keeps you in this mode. So that's the first category of people. Those that have not accepted Jesus as a personal savior, they have not been baptized. They don't believe in church. They don't believe in you know, forgiveness, any of all these things. The second category of the people is... 
They believe they are superhuman beings. That nothing can touch them. That they can rule the world. They have money, they have fame, and they have pleasure. And they can tell everybody to shove it. And so because they, have, they are arrogant, you know, and they believe that, you know, they have the money if they get in trouble to get out of it. And usually, when those kind of people get into trouble, they usually don't get out of it. Sometimes they pay with their life. Sometimes they pay with their entire wealth. And, and those usually happen with the people that are very well connected. They are famous. They believe they can do anything they want to. That's why you see a lot of the famous people, you know, that have been seen in television or, you know, you know whatever all kinds of profession, you know, that, you know, they get into a lot of trouble. It becomes a scandal for them because they believe that they are superhuman beings. So, but they need Jesus just like the ordinary person. The third are the people that don't have strong faith, even though that they are Christians. And they keep still letting doubt come in. And one of the things that I often ask those kind of people to pray for is to rebuke the devil, which is the enemy. Because when you start doubting your faith in God, the devil lo loves that. The devil will be there to now turn your doubt into fear and then turn your pain into problems and turn all of your you know, craziness to sorrow. And But when you say, I stand on the promises of the Lord and Luke 1, 37, that for with God all things are possible, then you put the enemy behind you so your faith is strong. Again, don't forget, when you did make an introduction to this program, you said, Wisdom for You is one of those Bible-based programs that, you know, you know encourage people to stand on the promises of the Lord and encourages people and, you know, to believe and have the faith anchored in God. And when they do so, God will give them a prosperous life with an expected end. So that third category of people are those that does not have faith. And then they can have problems. That's why every Sunday we ask them, go to church. And then you hear the word, read the Bible, you know, study the word. And that can strengthen your faith. Will you end this program for us in a prayer? Yes. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you know, we thank you for the opportunity to have come to share, you know, wisdom with the world at large. There is no one that have wisdom other than it always comes from you. Lord, we are sinners and only saved by grace and mercy. To our listeners out there, to me personally, to my church family, and our brothers and sisters that have listened to this, I ask that you forgive everyone their sin. If there is anyone out there that may have done something wrong, I know that you have the power, Jesus, to be able to make them whole. As they repent of their sin, open the windows of heaven, let them be received by the Heavenly Father, so that the grace of the Almighty God will be sufficient for them. Let them own and take ownership for their own issue. And as they go back, you know, to try to restore, restitute, and then make amends with those that may have hurt, let it be received with the enduring love of Jesus Christ. We thank you for this opportunity to be with the world community, to share your word to the world. It was God, it is God, it will always be God. In Jesus' name, amen. Wisdom for You is brought to you by One God Ministry, a global church. You can visit us online at www.onegodministry.org and you can join us for worship services in Fairfax, Virginia, Alexandria, Virginia, Jarrett, Virginia, Miami, Florida, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Kenya, East Africa, and many more. Thanks for watching and we'll be back again with you next time.